everybody, and welcome to another episode of Echo Live. My name is Anna, coming to you from the Michigan Science Center's Echo Distance Learning Program. Today, we are talking all about nuclear chain reactions. Um, this one's going to be a pretty cool episode. I've got a couple of fun demonstrations that you can try at home to really simply understand some nuclear science, which is really high level stuff, but it can still be really fun to try out some of these experiments to understand exactly how it works and why engineers are so concerned about figuring out nuclear energy. Now, go ahead, if you haven't done so already, and introduce yourself in the chat feature on wherever you are joining from. Hello to Evan from Texas. Hi from Owen. Hello, everyone who's joining in on lots of familiar faces popping in already on Facebook and in YouTube. Welcome, everybody. Hello, everyone who's watching through Zoom as well. Um, shout out to those of you who have already filled out our Echo um, evaluation survey that I posted yesterday. Um, we'll be sure to post that link again in the chat and with the description for our videos um, that so that you can give us your feedback about what you've thought about Echo Live so far. You can give us suggestions for episodes you might like us to try or see before the end of June and as we continue through summer. Um, but you can also fill out that survey in order to win a free week of virtual summer camp with the Michigan Science Center, which is going to be really cool and exciting. So thank you to those of you who filled it out already. If you haven't filled it out yet, don't worry. Um, we are still looking for your responses. We really want to hear your feedback because these programs are all about you and what you are learning um, here with us. So let's get started talking about nuclear chain reactions. And before we even get into any chain reactions, we need to figure out what exactly we're talking about when we are talking about nuclear science and nuclear energy. Basically, we're talking about the nucleus of an atom. So we need to talk about a classic example of an atom model to understand how nuclear science works. Here's a typical model of an atom. Now, in the center, this is what we're mainly concerned with here when we're talking about nuclear science. Um, this center part is what we call the nucleus. And the nucleus is made up of two distinct parts. There are protons, which in this model are designated as these red balls with the positive symbol on them because protons are positive. And then there's also these orangey yellow colored balls, which we call neutrons. So the nucleus contains both. It contains both the protons and the neutrons very, very closely packed together, very, right in the very center of our atom. Now, surrounding the nucleus, we have our electrons. And we've talked about electrons a lot here on Echo Life because electrons are really important when it comes to interactions between molecules. Electrons are involved in bonding, which we've talked about during some of our chemistry episodes. The flow or movement of electrons is what gives us electricity, which we've also talked about a few times here on Echo Live. But we said that today we are mainly concerned with this centerpiece of our atom called the nucleus. So let's think critically about our nucleus here. We have positively charged protons and neutrons, which have no charge at all. So overall, the nucleus is positively charged. It's only made up of things with either a positive charge or no charge at all. That helps the electrons to orbit around, but we need to think about how exactly that works. And so we're gonna create our own atom model. Um, so we're gonna create an edible atom model. Um, it's something that we've done um, when we talked about what DNA, we made an edible DNA model. And so today we're gonna make an edible atom model using some of the same materials. So I've got those colorful mini marshmallows, which I think are pretty delicious. Um, and these are going to serve as those different pieces of our atom. We're going to use these to represent our protons or neutrons and our electrons. Um, we've also got a couple other things here. I've got some peanut butter, um, which is going to designate one of our forces. And then I've got some toothpicks as well. So just um, three simple materials. And I'll also give you some alternatives in case um, you don't want to use one of these materials when you are trying to recreate this at home. So we said that in an atom model, let's start by building our nucleus. And that is what our peanut butter is for. Because we've talked about positive and negative charges on Echo Live in the past. 
And we said that in magnetism and in electricity, um, opposites attract, but like charges will repel. They push apart. They don't want to be anywhere near each other. So just how do we get all those positively charged protons to stick together, right? If the, nu if the nucleus is only made up of things with positive charge and no negative charges, right? They would want to push away. They want to repel. But Raoul mentioned on a past episode of Echo Live that there are forces, um, there are four main types of interactions, which we sometimes call forces in the universe, and some are stronger than others. We said that gravity is one of those weak interactions, but nuclear bonding uh, is actually one of the strongest interactions. So the force that holds the nucleus together is actually much stronger than electrostatic repulsion, which is that force of the positively charged protons wanting to push apart from each other. So the peanut butter, which is really, really sticky, is going to simulate that force holding together the protons and neutrons of our nucleus. Now, we can designate um, some colors to represent different things if you want, or you can just remember based on the placement. Now, if you are allergic to peanuts, um, of course, I do not recommend that you try using peanut butter for this atom model, but you can use one of those um, nut butter alternatives like sunflower butter, which is super delicious, or you could try frosting or even marshmallow fluff would work just fine for this. Um, so if we think back to that picture we saw, we had pink and orange which represents our protons and our neutrons. So we're just going to take one of those and we're gonna start coating it with some peanut butter. This activity can be a little bit messy, but remember, as long as you wash your hands before, um, everything we're using is edible. And so you can lick your fingers um, or eat your atom model when you are done. Um, so we are sticking together some of those protons and neutrons to form the nucleus of our atom protons and neutrons only. So we only have positively charged or neutrally charged objects here in the center of our atom model. So pink and orange, pink and orange. Now, generally, the rule goes that the protons are what determine the identity of this atom. So if you are counting, let me lick my fingers here. If you are counting, we have one, two, three protons. Oh, no, I'm sorry, we have four protons and we'll need one more neutron if we're wanting to make them equal. So we've got four protons and four neutrons forming our nucleus, but we're not done, right? We also need to add in our electrons, but the electrons we can't just stick in with peanut butter. Those are held together by those electrostatic forces. Um, because these electrons are negatively charged, they will kind of hold on to our nucleus. And so they actually form what we call orbits. So we'll go ahead and we'll poke some of our electrons down here into our atom model, putting them around our nucleus in what we might call orbitals. Let it spread out. Now, this version of this activity can be a little bit messy, so if you're not a fan of this version, you can also make a paper model of an atom using a piece of paper like I have oops, right here. Now that I got peanut butter on it anyway. All right, now that I've covered it in peanut butter and almost defeated the purpose of keeping this model clean, well, you can also just lay them out on a piece of paper. And you've seen that I drew the nucleus in the center, which is where you would place your protons and neutrons. And then you'd place your electrons around your orbitals floating around your nucleus. The downside to this, right, is that it's only two dimensional. Whereas with your mini marshmallow atom model, you can actually simulate um, the three dimensional space that your electrons would need to take up while they orbit around the nucleus of your atom. Either option works perfectly fine. Um, but we want to think about now, how does this give us any sort of energy whatsoever? There are two major processes that um, nuclear scientists are working on in order to give us generally pretty clean and efficient energy. Now, you can think of those interactions holding together your nucleus. You can think of it 
as like a tightly wound rubber band, right? We said that that rubber band is strong enough to overcome the electrostatic repulsion of those protons. That rubber band is holding everything together, even though those protons are trying their best to push apart and repel away from each other. So all we need to do is disrupt those forces in order to harness some energy. These two forces that we use are called nuclear fission and nuclear fusion. We're going to start by talking about nuclear fission because nuclear fission is actually the one that we use to generate power in nuclear power plants. So let's take a look at what that process would look like in another drawing of an atom model and then we can come back to our one that we created down here on the table. So in nuclear fission, we have what we call a target nucleus. And in order for fission to work, we have to use a pretty large atom. Um, so normally, does anyone know which elements off our periodic table we use to create nuclear fission? Is anyone familiar? So if you think through our periodic table, maybe it would help if I put up a diagram right here behind me. So if I put up a diagram of our periodic table, we said that the number of protons in the nucleus of this atom is what gives it its identity. If there's just one proton, that's hydrogen, element number one. If there's two protons, that's helium, element number two, and so on. They're arranged in order, so they go from least all the way across, and then they keep going down the line, and they get heavier and heavier and heavier. Now, we said that in order for a element to be used in nuclear fission, it has to be pretty large and heavy, and we'll talk about why in just a moment. But based on the periodic table behind me, maybe you can see some examples. Uh, maybe you want to pick an element that you think would be good for fission, or maybe you know which ones we use for fission. Does anyone have any idea? Oh, yeah, lots of people are familiar that most commonly, Helena said it, we use uranium. Um, so uranium is way down at the bottom of my table. You can actually see it oops, if I scoot just this way. Um, so uranium is right down here. Um, and uranium is element number 92. Um, so there are 92 protons and 92 neutrons in the nucleus of a typical uranium atom. But we actually use what we call an isotope of uranium when we're talking about nuclear fission. Um, isotopes mean that we've added a bunch more neutrons to that nucleus. So we can't add protons, right? Because if we had protons, it would change the atomic number and it would shift along this bottom row the more we add. But we can add more and more and more neutrons, which it just makes the element even more unstable, which sounds bad, but it's good when we're talking about nuclear energy. So we add a whole bunch more neutrons and we actually turn it into uranium number 235. Um, so we add a ton of extra neutrons to it to make that nucleus really, really large, just like we see here inside this diagram. So there are a ton of protons and neutrons packed into that nucleus. In a fission reaction, we take stray neutrons and we just bombard all these molecules with neutrons. Eventually, a neutron will strike the target nucleus and it will actually break it apart. You can think of it like that rubber band surrounding the nucleus, holding together all those positively charged um, particles, you can think of it as breaking open that rubber band and it splits the atom into two smaller pieces. Now, each of these pieces will take a few of the electrons with them, but when we do this, some of those added neutrons that we added to create our uranium isotope they come off this reaction. So we bombarded this nucleus with just one neutron, broke it into two smaller pieces, and then all of these stray neutrons can go on to do the same thing. You can think of this like a chain reaction, right? Chain reactions take place because your energy keeps getting carried through step by step by step. Now, I'm sure that some of you have tried this next demonstration before, but maybe you haven't quite thought about how it applies to nuclear chemistry. 
But I have um, a setup here of Jenga pieces. Um, Jenga pieces work fantastic for this, but you could also use dominoes if you have dominoes laying around your house um, or really anything that you can arrange in a line to create a chain reaction of your own. So you can see here that I've arranged my Jenga pieces in a way that's pretty similar to our nuclear fission reaction. Our first one, which is way here in the back, is going to topple over and strike two more Jenga pieces. Think back to that diagram that we just looked at, right? Our initial fission reaction where we split that one target nucleus, let go of three other neutrons, which can go on to hit three more target molecules. So these reactions get bigger and bigger and bigger as they go. So let's take a look at this, at this chain reaction when we set it off. So all we're going to do is topple our first domino and watch as this single neutron is carried through the system. Here we go. Now, it wasn't a perfect reaction, but there's a couple things I'd like for you to try if you do this at home. Now, this was 20, um, this was 20 dominoes, and they all knocked over pretty quickly. Now, I have exactly 20 more dominoes or Jenga pieces here, and what we're going to do is set them up in a bit more of a straight line. Because when we're doing nuclear chemistry in a power plant, we don't want our reactions to get out of control. Um, having a reaction get out of control can be very, very dangerous when we're talking about nuclear reactions, right? We know that in fission reactions, you might have heard that these create some radioactive waste, but they also release an immense amount of energy when we break that uh, rubber band holding together those particles inside your nucleus. If this reaction gets too out of control, it could be really dangerous for the people that work in the power plants, that live around the power plants. And of course, there's been some pretty dangerous events in history where that's actually happened. Um, so fission is the kind of reaction we actually use in power plants, where we're splitting one large atomic nucleus into two smaller parts. And then we actually use the energy to heat water to turn to steam, which we then can turn into power for our homes and for our cities. So in this next version, this is what we would call a um, critical process. And so in actual nuclear reactors, we use what we call control rods in order to channel the reaction. So we can actually set up barriers of other elements like cadmium, and they'll actually block those neutrons from going on and getting too out of control. And so this would simulate more of what really happens inside a nuclear reactor. Let's see if you can get a closer view. Probably want to zoom out just a little bit more. All right. So this is an example of more of a controlled reaction, one that would actually take place in something like a power plant. So let's go ahead. We'll start back here. Oh no, just barely off. So this is something you can try at home. See how that reaction was much more controlled, much more predictable, which is exactly what scientists want. We want that controlled release of energy and we accomplish this using those control rods. You can try setting up your reaction in that first kind of web-like formation, but try blocking the reaction um, using something like a piece of cardboard or our handy dandy laminated card, which I like to use. And that can act as your control rod. You can actually uh, funnel your reaction using these control rods, which we really do use in nuclear reactors. Now I have another really great example here that I've set up before our program. And just scoot a couple things out of the way. I want you to be able to see the whole thing because this is actually one of my favorite chain reaction experiments. Um, and I set this one up using popsicle sticks or these jumbo craft sticks, which we've seen on past episodes of Echo Live. Now, what I've done before the program is I've just gotten it started and we're going to add even more popsicle sticks to our nuclear reactor here. Now, this works the same way. We always talk about energy in terms of its um, movement between potential and kinetic. We know that we can never um, create energy, right? We can never destroy energy. We just change it between its various forms. 
Um, this happens in nuclear reactors too, right? That potential energy comes from that rubber band, that force holding together the nucleus. It's stored and it's ready to be released or it's waiting to be released um, as soon as it's struck with another neutron. Um, so what we have here is weaved together popsicle sticks. And I'm gonna show you exactly how I weaved them in case you're interested in trying this on your own. See if we can get a closer look down here on my table. All right, so you can see that they're crisscrossed over one another, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And we've got room for a few more popsicle sticks or craft sticks to be added into our chain reaction here. If you place it under this one, but over the next one, so the order goes under the back one, over the front one, and just keep going. Now, if I let go, right, that energy is going to be immediately converted back into kinetic energy, the energy of motion. There's a lot of tension on these sticks and they're really trying to push back to their original shape. They don't like to be stretched like this, just like the rubber band around the nucleus doesn't want to be stretched either. So we've got room for maybe two or three more that we're just weaving in just in that same pattern over and over and over. And we are storing up as much potential energy as we possibly can, just using these jumbo craft sticks. Now I'm gonna keep my finger right there on the end and zoom back out because this reaction is super fun. And we're gonna watch this energy be rapidly converted from potential, which is stored across all of these about 90 craft sticks as soon as I let go of my fingers. So let's go ahead and we are going to convert our energy in three, two, one. Now, I love this demonstration because it does a much better job of showing just how much energy is released in a nuclear reaction. It's not just that we're splitting molecules, right? When we do that, there's energy, stored energy that's being released. But fission is not the only type of nuclear reaction scientists are working on. But fission is the one that we use in power plants right now. It's because it's pretty easy to control. Um, we can slowly create fission processes and harness that energy in a safe way. But what we really want to do is accomplish nuclear fusion. Um, fusion is pretty different. So let's take a look at an example of nuclear fusion. Now fusion, unlike fission, only works with really, really small atoms. Normally, we will take isotopes of hydrogen, um, if we call this one deuterium and this one tritium, and we'll combine these two isotopes of hydrogen. Remember, these are both hydrogen because they still both only have one proton, one proton up here, one proton down here. Um, and that's what determines the identity of these atoms. So we actually will take those and we'll combine them in a process that we call fusion to give us one helium atom, a free neutron, and then just an immense um, release of energy. This process yields much more energy than the process of fission can. But there are a couple problems with fusion. In order to accomplish fusion, it has to take place under extreme temperature and pressure, almost so extreme that it's really expensive and really, really difficult to accomplish in a lab setting. Um, scientists are still working on this though, right? Because the amount of energy produced from fusion reactions is exponentially more than in a fission reaction. So it would give us much more power if we could figure out how to do it safely. Um, fusion is what happens in the sun. So Paulette talked to us on our virtual planetarium program last week about the different types of stars, including our favorite star, it should be everyone's favorite star, the sun. Fusion is what's happening in the sun all the time. Hydrogen atoms are fusing together, releasing energy, which we benefit from because that energy carries all the way here to earth. 
that process is almost perfect and it generates very, very little waste. Someone mentioned in the comments that fission reactions are toxic or some of the waste created in nuclear reactions is toxic. Nuclear reactions are, all, are actually one of the cleanest forms of energy on Earth. Um, even though it does produce radioactive materials, um, it's actually still much more energy efficient um, and less damaging to the Earth than harnessing things like fossil fuels. But fusion would be the future. Fusion is almost a perfect process. If we could figure out how to do it safely and efficiently in a lab, if we could manipulate those variables of temperature and pressure in order to have fusion take place, it is much cleaner and it would generate even much radioactive, even much less radioactive waste than fission would. So nuclear energy really is the future. Um, and it's something that scientists are still actively working to find out more about and learn how we can actually harness it. Um, of course, we wanna highlight a couple scientists who are doing just that. And I of course wanna take a moment and highlight our STEMinista project. Now women, are engineering nuclear solutions for nuclear power. Um, two people I wanted to mention are two very interesting people. The first is Ciara Sibbles. And last year, or in, I think it was late 2018, she was actually the first female Black woman to graduate from the University of Michigan in nuclear engineering. Um, so she has a doctorate degree, and she now went on to work at Johns Hopkins. And she's actually studying the future of nuclear energy right here in the United States, trying to get us to that next step of nuclear power. And of course, I have to highlight one more person, a fellow Anna. Um, Anna has a really interesting backstory. Anna Viela goes to Purdue University, and she works on a team that's trying to create the first entirely digital nuclear reactor. So this helps us to study nuclear reactions safely um, in a digital way, rather than actually doing actual experiments with atoms and molecules. Her grandpa actually worked on the Manhattan Project, and she has two other nuclear engineers in her family, um, but she is actively working on this as well. Now, I have one very last video I'd like to show you before we head out. Um, this is a great time that if you have any questions, um, go ahead and type them in the chat. I'd love to answer any questions that you might have before we go. Um, while I wait for some questions to come in, I see a couple already and we'll get to those in just a moment. Um, I'd like to show you another video um, of a different kind of chain reaction that, trust me, I've tried to recreate this in the lab and it just hasn't gone that well so far, um, but I'm hoping we'll get to show you this kind of reaction and this is using mouse traps as your potential to kinetic energy converters. Um, someone in this lab used this to replicate nuclear power. Um, this is a super slowed down version of this experiment filmed with super slow motion cameras. So in this diagram of fission, this is um, a model of fission, they use that first wiffle ball to simulate the neutron. Let's see, as soon as we see it. So it's over here on the right side of the screen, kind of almost out of view. But this simulates that first neutron, striking just one other isotope here of uranium inside our nuclear reactor. Once that happens, a chain reaction starts. And these start to um, travel through and through and through. And they do a great job of simulating this release of kinetic energy, which we can then harness to power our homes and our cities. I think this video is pretty cool. Um, I definitely don't recommend trying to recreate one at home unless you have an adult who wants to help you do it safely. Um, like I said, I've tried and I've gotten quite a few bruised fingers from having mouse traps go off before I'm ready to have them go off. It's really difficult and really tricky, requires um, a degree of patience that I am still actively working on. So if you can't get it on your first try, don't worry. I'm still working on that as well. Um, Justin asked a good question. Is nuclear power like pushing magnets? And the answer is yes. Um, magnets attract and repel just like those particles inside an atom. We said that there are nuclear forces holding together the nucleus like a rubber band wrapped around magnets that are trying to repel away from each other. All it takes is that one neutron traveling in to break that rubber band, to release that energy, which we can then harness. 
Um, so it's a lot like magnets. We always talk about how electricity and magnetism or charges are really, really linked. Um, and this is a great example of that. You are exactly right. Lots of people making that connection. That's really cool to see that you guys are making that connection right here in the chat. Um, all right, last announcement before we head out today. If you do have any last questions, go ahead, type them in the chat. Um, someone asked about our survey because like we mentioned at the beginning of this episode, um, we are offering our My Size Spark summer camps. Um, and so you can actually enter to win a free week of My Size Spark camp by completing our Echo Live feedback survey. That link got posted in the comments on Facebook I saw, I think on YouTube as well. I'll be sure to post it right here in the Zoom meeting before we head out. But all you need to do is fill out that survey and you'll get entered to win a free week of camp. Um, we're going to leave the survey up for at least one more week. And so if you are interested in signing up for MySize Spark Camp, um, the registration links already went live today. I would highly recommend filling out a registration form um, signing up for your week of camp because spots are limited for those camps um, and we can always announce the winner um, and work with you later to either add on an additional week of camp or have that week of camp um, funded for you. So definitely fill it out. It's been awesome to see everybody's responses come in already. Um, let me see if I can get that link. Here it is, copy. I'm gonna post it in Zoom for our friends watching in Zoom. Um, try to go ahead and click this link fill out our survey. Um, and other than that, this is the end of our program for today, all about nuclear reactions. We'll be back here tomorrow with even more Echo Live. If you are interested in signing up for camp, visit our website, mi-sci.org camps, and you can register to see me and some of our other virtual educators all through the month of July. So with that, that's the end of our